So I've started recording and I would like to start by uh, giving two small announcements. One is that we are operating under the antitrust policy of Linux Foundation. And we are also, uh, so anyone who wants to know that in greater detail can go to the Hyperledger Wiki and find, find more about that. The other announcement is about uh, the uh, code of conduct, which is basically you can disagree with people without being disagreeable. You can also be agreeable with people without being disagreeable. So, you know, basically be nice. That is the uh, short and long of it. And I want to introduce Igor Yoshpa. Um, and I have one question. I mean, he is from uh, Nornickel. You've seen his uh, bio. He's got 15 plus years in the industry. Now he's working with Nornickel. And I will leave Igor to talk more about Nornickel and the other, you know, basic stuff. Um, so uh, before we start, Igor, do you want me to do the sharing or you can do the sharing because you should be uh, free to share the screen if you go to the bottom. And that yeah, actually, you if you don't mind, I'll just, uh, you know, do the uh, swiping myself if that's okay with you. Yeah, of course. Uh, okay. There is uh, Jan uh, from Nornickel who's just joined. And, uh, you know, I know him for a while and even before he joined Nordico. So anyway, it's good to see you, Jan. Uh, anyway, uh, so can you share your screen and start the presentation, please? Thanks for showing yeah. up. Yeah. Just one second. Uh, so let's see. Uh, let's do it like this because Zoom is glitching, so no peeking. All right. The obligatory Zoom question, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. Then let's kick off. So uh, thank you, Vipin, and a uh, good time of day or night, everyone, wherever you are. The Swiss DLT bill recently came to our attention, and uh, we uh, had a brief chance to look into it. So I wanted to share some thoughts about it and why I think it's an important topic for Hyperledger community. Because it presents, in my opinion, uh, it presents us with an opportunity to both promote our technology uh, and uh, take DLT adoption to a next level, possibly worldwide. Now, lack of regulation or, well, poorly described legal frameworks are known to be the uh, key stop factors for any tech adoption. And while it's not an obstacle to some, uh, the institutional segment is surely always looking for more clarity before they move on. Another existing challenge that's been going on for ages really is that uh, legal and tech, they, well, they don't always talk on the same language, which may create miscommunication. And uh, it's no wonder because those are two highly sophisticated fields, but as a result, we sometimes end up in situations where um, the pace of the technology is limited by existing legal frameworks, which is understandable, but it doesn't really have to be that way. So we have definitely seen uh, some positive dynamics uh, in various jurisdictions of the world over the past few years. And it certainly does look like an upward trajectory. Now, we must nevertheless keep in mind that when a jurisdiction refers to itself as being um, crypto friendly, well, actually, no, I don't wanna use the word crypto because it has so many wrong meanings today. When it refers to itself as being DLT friendly, it doesn't mean that you're gonna get an easy pass. It's not like, you know, getting a driver license, you go take a thought and take the test. No, all it means is that the regulatory framework is open for consideration of your case but it's still your legal obligation to show them 
and uh, to prove them how your case is license worthy. So the latest contribution in this regulation is the Swiss DLT bill that uh, came out recently, actually in the beginning of this year, if I recall, which is really a big step forward towards general DLT adoption uh, because this particular bill penetrates various affected fields of law, making adjustments that were really mapped around the actual existing technology. And this, I think, is a very big and notable step forward uh, when we get not some, well, let's call them vague guidelines, but rather something that considers the way the technology is actually meant to be operating. So um, obtaining a license, especially in the field of uh, dealing security, is never easy. But when you, taught, uh, when you add a new technology, which essentially becomes the backbone of your trading venue, of your system, it doesn't make it any easier. Um, so one needs to create a lot of specific materials, a lot of uh, info decks, uh, whatnot, showing how you feel fulfill all the regulatory requirements. And you don't, you never get a like a step by step manual or instruction. It's up to you to figure your uh, SDLC processes or your disaster recovery plan or how you're gonna back up your information, which sounds especially funny when we talk about DLT systems, um, or how you're going to create fair and secure conditions for all your uh, users in your trading venues. I mean, common best practices obviously apply, but there is always room for maneuvers. And now imagine this situation from the other side, from the regulatory, when you have like uh, 50 different applications coming in with uh, venues that are essentially using the same backbone technology, but they're trying to explain it in their different terms, in their own way. So it never helps. However, uh, there are several things that can be done to address this challenge, which should and could make things a little easier for both sides, in my opinion. So one is uh, we could look into certifying Hyperledger Fabric as a Swiss DLT law compliant solution. Now, this obviously for many reasons could uh, prove to be highly challenging, right? And one of the reasons is, well, Hyperledger Fabric, it's not really a blockchain, right? It's, uh, it's a framework for creating blockchains. However, if we could achieve this, this would really be a game changer in my opinion, because it would create a new, a really a new market standard. Uh, obviously it would strengthen Hyperledger position worldwide greatly, and uh, it would aid with further adoption across the globe. Now, yes, obviously it would require individual certification jurisdiction by jurisdiction, but the actual preparation work would only need to be done once for the most part. Now, why worldwide is because, well, we sometimes see cases where uh, regulators of different jurisdiction try to adapt things that proved to work in their friendly environment. So it will just make an easier transition to other countries eventually. Another option, which may be a little easier, uh, is creating certain, how do you call them, um, template info decks, uh, addressing how the HLF components fulfill one or the other requirement found among the articles in the DLT bill. And I'm going to talk about how, in my opinion, HLF is almost like a natural fit for this bill in just a moment. Now, you may say, well, Igor, you're not really very far seen, are you? Uh, just go to the wiki, download the documentation, and be happy, be done. Well, yes, I could do that. And uh, actually, incredible work has been done by the community in creating and drafting all that incredible technical documentation. But unfortunately, to make it useful for this particular cause, it needs to be remapped into a language understood by regulatory and terms generally accepted by them. Now, I will give you a simple example. When we talk about tokens, uh, we all talk the same language, we understand what they are. But if you take FINMA, for example, uh, one of the first things they did, they classified tokens into different categories, payments, utility, and asset. And uh, each of this category of token is allowed to do particular things. So when you talk to them, you know, and you mentioned tokens, you need to be very careful and very specific about what you do. And this is exactly the type of alignment I'm talking about that, you know, 
would be great to get done here. Because once we start speaking the same language, just it gets things moving at a different pace. And such standardized, in fact, they would be standardized infodex would not only make HLF a solution more attractive for easier adoption for who, for any user, but but also make it easier for the regulators because they would be working with standardized documents. So it's just easier on both sides. Now, um, let's look at how Hyperledger Fabric fits inside the existing Swiss DLT framework and why I think that it is indeed a kind of a natural fit. So to do that, we're going to take some of the articles found in the in the bill, obviously not all of them, given the little time we have today, but I try to pick those that I feel are the most crucial and important. And we're gonna see how Hyperledger fits against them. So the bill tells us that we need to create conditions where independent parties ensure that no unauthorized modification occurs. Well, okay, makes sense. And in fact, I will come back to this point a little later down the presentation because this is very important, but let's look at this from a glance for now. So um, Hyperledger Fabric separates transaction validation, block creation, and ledger bookkeeping into different type of nodes, ensuring separation of duties and data access on the need to know basis. So that's number one. Um, nodes of uh, each type may be operated by independent entities. So there is no single point of change. The final decision is based on the consensus between the validators. That's two. Mm, the ledger, including smart contracts, is stored independently by multiple validators, making local changes while well, essentially pointless. So that's two. So actually, no, that's three for those of you keeping count. <laughs> uh, the ledger snapshot can be compared with other nodes uh, in the same organization or in fact in different organizations to verify the consistency and integrity of the ledger on each peer. So the way I see it, it's a good fit so far. So I would put a check mark here. Let's move on. Smart contracts. The bill asks us to store information on the ledger. Well, pretty self-explanatory. Now in the case with HLF, smart contracts are natively built into it in the form of chain code. So no off-chain logic is needed for transaction processing. I see this as another check. Let's move on. Due diligence. Well, um, this is what we commonly know, and it's already part of everybody's life probably. It's the KYC, KYB, AML procedures. Uh, and essentially, uh, this, is, this is common for because the user identification and permissions are uh, the fundamental elements of Hyperledger Fabric architecture because it was designed as a permission system from, from, from origin. So another check. Uh, transparency. So this talks about, you know, being able to access stored information, making sure that it's valid. All right, let's look at this. By providing bookkeeping only nodes um, or committers or peers for that matter, uh, HLF makes it possible for every participant to personally monitor the ledger contents and integrity without participating in resource consuming endorsement process. So, okay, that's one way of doing it. Ledger snapshots, which is a neat function that appeared in the ledger uh, in the later, I believe, 2.x versions, uh, they can be used to verify the consistency and integrity of uh, entire validators network. At the same time, data privacy is secured by cryptographical means, uh, ensuring that only transacting parties can clearly identify the records related to themselves. So mm, if you have some really sensitive information, just you know, run it in the private channel. Uh, and the programming code of Hyperledger Fabric smart contracts is written in, um, how do I put it? with general purpose programming languages. Uh, in other words, it's easily readable by any interested party, whether it's the obligator, the creditor, or, or, or an external auditor for that matter. So another check. Um, okay, so we've talked about validations a few slides uh, before, and that there were no visible challenges so far. But if we dive a little deeper, we see that the bill is talking about, and I quote, you can see it on the screen, 
joint management by several independent participants. And we're not really told how independent they need to be from each other. But if you ask me, I am definitely getting some vibes of a public blockchain reference here. So if that's the case, then we need a consensus mechanism. And yes, you could use a natively built-in raft, uh, but this would mean that you, as the DLT operator, would need to guarantee that each and everyone in your validator pool is a trusted party. Why? Well, because Raft is, uh, well, it's really a crash tolerance mechanism more than anything because it was meant initially for the private DLT applications where you know for a fact that every party is trusted. So do you really want to take on such responsibility? Well, I'm not sure. And um, this is where BFT comes into play. Now, a little retrospective, a little history. So a few years back, we have introduced our BFT solution to the community as, as a plugin that allows building public permission blockchains on Harper Ledger Fabric. And we presented it on a bootcamp that was hosted in Moscow. Now, I can't tell you how many crazy looks we got. I mean, people were going like, what? what? What are these guys smoking? I mean, why are you taking something that was initially designed uh, and originated as a private permission blockchain? And why do you try to make something out of it that was never meant to be? Well, some years have passed and now we not just have a use case for it, but we have a legislation to support that. So just something to keep in mind. Uh, information on BFT is uh, publicly available, actually included the link in the presentation that will be shared later on with you. Uh, so just keep that in mind. Okay, now those are the key probably things I wanted to highlight with respect to how HLF fits within the Swiss DLT law. And uh, in my opinion, it really looks like a natural fit being permissioned by design. And uh, with the help of the BFT, I mean, if you want to build a public blockchain, well, there you go, there's your solution. There is something else I wanted to share with you. And uh, also it doesn't really kind of uh, quite fit directly into our um, HLF, like legal fitment discussion. Those are nevertheless interesting things to keep in mind if you wish to operate under the Swiss DLT law or just, you know, uh, we never know which other jurisdiction might, may adopt it. So the first thing I, that caught my attention is the relationship between the DLT operator and the issuer. Essentially, the way the legislation is mapped now, uh, it doesn't make the distinction between the two. So what does that mean? If you are an issuer and you're just taking some DLT system to make all the transaction, well, that's fine. However, if you're trying, trying to build something else, something bigger, if you're trying to build a kind of an open but permissioned ecosystem, where you would introduce and invite a variety of different issuers. Well, this means according to the law that these issuers are now obliged to perform a lot of actions that would uh, ensure the sustainability and operation of the DLC system. Essentially all of the requirements we spoke before, the issuer is responsible for that, which I don't think is fair if you're trying to work uh, in a PAS, PAAS, well, I mean, platform as a service kind of a type of setup. So this is the way it's done now. It's, this is the way it's mapped and explained now. Uh, however, in the future, it's very possible that we will see that these roles and responsibility will be split as more use cases appear. Another thing is the new kind of license that we now have. Uh, I mean, before we had this license, uh, you were still you know, fully capable of operating a DLT system and trading digital securities on it under different types of regulations. However, now we have a specific one tailored around the DLT systems. Uh, but what I found interesting about it, or um, at least the way, uh, the way I, I have an impression about it, is that it's really mapped this particular license, the DLT trading facility license, around systems with the uh, order book, uh, order management system, and uh, automation. Essentially, you're like, um, classical exchange, so, which is fine, which is perfect. This, this is most of the cases that we see in the market today. However, if you wish to build something else, a different kind of trading venue, um, I don't know, some kind of a semi-automated OTC desk, 
Well, you may need to get creative and careful about it. So keep that in mind. Uh, DLT and the real world. Yeah. So essentially, what the legislation tells us now is that the, your traditional kind of a signature prevails over your uh, private signature, private key signature. Um, is that a bad thing? Well, not necessarily. So what this means right now is that the regulators re recognize this as uh, essentially uh, applicable way and formal way and uh, of sign and transaction. But for now, they're just being a little cautious. And uh, as we build trust, uh, it is possible that we will see eventually that those two will be uh, given the same rights. Uh, wallet recovery. Now, this one, this one is interesting. <laughs> so when we talk about blockchains, we are accustomed to the logic that um, if you lose your private key, well, too bad, it's gone. But not in this particular case. So what the Swiss DLT law tells us is that we as the operator or as the issuer, as I said there a little next, we must create conditions uh, upon which if the user, uh, if the obviously the user that was verified on KYC loses access to his wallet, so he loses his private key, for example, uh, we must create through organizational and technical uh, means and measures conditions where we would be able to restore that. So let me give you a different example. Uh, for example, I bought one million or one million dollar worth of tokens in Palladium, right? So what does this mean? This means that there is a one million dollar of Palladium sitting somewhere in the world because, well, if not, then I probably chose the wrong service provider. So if I lose my private key, what happens to that metal? It, it doesn't disappear, it doesn't vanish. It's still sitting there. And um, essentially what the law tells us is that if I am able to prove my identity, which is possible, once again, point, going back to what we discussed, permission system, KYB, KYC, okay, I can prove it's me. Then I need to prove that I indeed was the rightful owner of those tokens in that amount, which is once again possible by looking at the ledger and confirming that particular number and uh, class of tokens was assigned to a particular private key. Then uh, the DLT operator, well, he just, or the issuer reissues these tokens, he burns the old ones. Essentially, it's, it's totally up to you how you want to mitigate and how you want to solve it. Uh, I mean, if you want to take it to a different step, uh, to a higher level, you can ensure the transparency and security of this, let's call it, restoration process, so it can be moved on chain and require consensus of the DLT operator, officer, maybe some, your KYC provider, maybe your uh, custodian and somebody else. So it's totally up to you. So those are the things um, I wanted to talk about today. Uh, there are open points, obviously, to this, whether it makes sense at all to investigate this direction and see if it would be possible and worthwhile to make Hyperledger Fabric DLT law compliant. But I just want to repeat myself and say once again that the way it's mapped now, the Swiss DLT law is really mapped around the existing tech, making it very valuable. And it is my understanding that some members of our community from Switzerland have been heavily involved and active about that. And so if that's the case, I really want to extend my gratitude and say thank you. You've done an amazing job. So now it is up for us as the community to figure out how far we want to take this. Thank you for your attention. Great. Um, so we have a lot, the thing that we have here is lots of time to discuss and ask questions. Uh, please uh, ask any questions that you may have to uh, Igor and hopefully he'll be able to answer. If not, someone else will step in. Whatever, whatever the way is that we conduct these discussions on capital market SIG. Can I first address the community, if I may? So, and ask the question, like, what do you think uh, about this idea of trying to make HLF essentially compliant to the Swiss DLT law? Because if we can pull that off, 
uh, we can do the same thing, for example, under NYDFS and other regulations. And this would put us as a community. And given how much time we invest into this technology, you know, supporting this, we will leave just everybody behind. Yeah, I mean, in fact, a couple of uh, people who Jim has uh, put uh, a comment in the in the uh, chat, but he unfortunately had to drop. Otherwise, he would have asked questions, I'm sure. He says, excellent presentation, mapping fabric to DLT law with consideration. Um, Money now is asking, is there any solution on identity that is currently mapped in Hyperledger? Uh, I know that there are, but uh, Igor, you have a answer to money? Uh, Manny, can you elaborate a little bit? In order to you know, meet, let's call the Swiss law of wallet recovery, you have to have your identity first established on the DLT. Mm -hmm. and then associate that identity to whatever assets uh, that are being used uh, or processed in the DLT. So mm -hmm. the question really is what kind of an identity solution exists currently in Hyperledger that you could then leverage and then say, hey, now, you know, we solved the identity problem. Now it's just a matter of looking at assets and asset lifecycle. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So uh, Hyperledger Fabric is essentially a permission system by default. So it is implied that we always know all of the parties inside there. And uh, from organizational means of the legal entity, uh, it's a matter of adding the KYC, KYB steps so that when we register a new user in our uh, system, we always know who that user is because once again, it's permissioned. We don't have any anonymity. So once we do that, uh, that user establishes uh, a pair of keys, uh, public and private. Private is something that uh, only he is aware of. Public is something that we can see once again in the public blockchain. So we as the DLT operator have the means of linking those two together. And we know the identity uh, of, the public, uh, of the public address. And if, uh, for example, I lost my private key and I can prove that, hey, I'm indeed Igor Oshpa and, you know, here go, like KYC me again, Go, I'll go through video identification or whichever measures, it's up to the company to decide what measures are sufficient. Uh, then it's a matter of just uh, pulling up uh, the ledger and uh, looking at the tokens that were assigned to my uh, public key. Does this make sense? Um, I mean, it's still the, the, the current, you know, the current architecture in most DLTs is address mapped onto map to assets on ledger, but not identity, mm -hmm. right? And that's the big difference. So um, the only way you could, as you said, the only way you could establish your identity is going to a centralized uh, DLT uh, administrator. And now you're back to decentralization. So it's all up to that one person or a, a committee or whatever you want to call that determines that who you are and how you are mapped. That defeats all yes, that. Yes. Kind of like defeats the purpose of decentralization. Yes, I agree with you. It's a very good point. And, you know, it's always about a compromise. Like, how far do you want to go with decentralization uh, while sustaining your business needs and make it kind of a compliant? Uh, can I uh, present another perspective on this? Uh, I also chair the Identity Working Group. And we had a presentation there of Kerry, which is the, uh, an architecture that is a decentralized architecture that allows me to create a recovery uh, situation by having a forward key um, that can be integrated with any system, including this, that would bring back decentralization. I mean, the, uh, idea of carry is that I declare a forward key, but do not use it. And uh, that means I declare a forward public key that I do not use right now, but I'm declaring that this is what I'm going to use in case I need to recover the key. And that 
key obviously has a private key behind it, which will then be um, stored off, offline or somewhere else. Uh, if you can integrate a system like that into this, then you could have decentralized recovery. Obviously, nobody wants to remember or, or custody their own keys. So uh, the availability of a good wallet solution will also be uh, necessary for this. Um, it is a little, little uh, you know, uh, involved for me to go into the details of this, but it, it does exist. Of course, uh, there are problems with that too. Uh, the other other way is to have an identity behind the public key and then have an already established owner owner key or something like that that doesn't appear on the ledger but which can be used off ledger in a provable way to change the key. Uh, within, and, uh, Ron has a question also. Oh yeah. Sure, he's, he's saying uh, the same thing that you're saying. <laughs> I'd like to discuss the uh, wallet recovery aspect more. I find that concerning. Yeah, I think, and, and Vipin, thanks a lot. And, and Igor, a great presentation. I, I think I'm, I'm just kind of expanding on or, or kind of aligning with some of Manny's concerns. And almost from an operational or a, a product perspective, I find that the wallet recovery aspect seems to put a very heavy burden on the issuer. Um, which opens up to me a whole bunch of risks. Around, and I know we talked about identity and Vipin. There's a lot of work that you've been doing in the identity space. Um, I, I, I just, as we look at the digitization of financial markets and securities, I, I, that whole wallet recovery aspect is a little concerning. That comes, you know, Manny, Vipin, we've been in financial markets for a long time. Um, I find that hard to bake into how operations occur in the security space at least currently. And, and Manny, I think I'm building on some of the stuff you previously said as well. Yeah. Anybody mm -hmm. else has uh, comments on this particular aspect of wallet recovery? It's, it's, it's definitely something new. It's a gray zone to be defined and a best practice to be established. And uh, yeah, if there are solutions, it's definitely interesting to look into them and see how they fit while maintaining decentralization. One other thing that I just had an idea is, uh, to make it a little more decentralized. So let's imagine a case where we have the DLT operator that like uh, runs uh, a lot of different issuers that runs a permission system. So all of his users are KYC, KYB, et cetera, et cetera. So um, this particular legal entity, the DLT operator is obviously, he has his uh, trusted third parties, one of which is uh, the one that provides the KYC, KYB, KYB services. Another one could be the one providing an audit or something else. So uh, the DLT operator could build a little kind of a consensus in between those trusted parties that could be validating this unusual activity. So to get away a little bit out of decentralization. I mean, obviously it doesn't solve it completely because uh, one could claim, well, you know, me as an authorized user, I can't take advantage of it and I can't uh, participate in the validation. Well, of course you can't because this is sensitive information. This is PII data we're talking about and uh, it needs to be stored securely. So that's, that's another case we need to consider. I Igor, can I just dive into that a little bit more? And again, I, I'm sorry that I'm fixating on the wallet recovery, but from the issuer perspective, if a beneficiary claims private key loss, there's I mean, I, I, you know, you all know the technology better than I do, but there's no, there's no way to prove that claim, correct? It, it, it is, yeah, it's a very good point. Uh, in, it's a legal, how to say, um, not an office, but an um, illegal anomaly because you can't really prove something that you don't have. You can prove something that you have, but you can't prove something to, that you don't have. So in that case, you need to create some kind of technical measures so that uh, you either block his... Uh, uh, his private key, uh, somehow you blacklist it or uh, you uh, burn the tokens, uh, it still needs to be investigated a little more what the better approach is. This way there is no double spending if that's kind of a, what you're aiming at. I mean, several people have proposed those solutions, meaning uh, the operator burns 
the token and reissues. That oh. means our operator token always overrides anything else. Uh, that means uh, it is basically a multi-sig kind of situation uh, where the operator's signature is enough to burn the token uh, and then reissues to the new uh, to the new private key. I mean, to the new public key of the of the person who suffered the loss. This has been proposed. The other one, which I said, carry. If you look into it in detail, you will find that that has already got the seeds of this idea that you somehow create a pathway for recovery uh, right up front, right in the beginning, so that. Uh, you are not locked into the private key because after all the uh, the spending check and the validation check is the one checking the key so if they check that okay do you have the private key of the uh, token uh, of the um, asset uh, public key or do you have a valid way of proving that you possess the new key. These these are you know two options. The other is the uh, like Igor said, the operator intruding by burning the token and reissuing. So these these are you know some of the ways uh, in which this can be done. And I think uh, this quest for decentralization. Uh, is kind of, it is not a binary thing, you know, according to me anyway, centralized slash decentralized is not a binary thing, it is a spectrum. Even in Bitcoin, uh, you know, there is, it, in fact, there is a lot of asset centralization, less than 2% of the uh, public key uh, own like 80% of the coin, uh, less than, you know, there is geographic centralization in miners, there is centralization among developers. There is, you know, there's no getting around this uh, centralization, decentralization problem. I mean, it is not a binary. It is not, it is a gray area. And that is my opinion, by the way. And I know that, uh, the maximalist Bitcoiners would jump down my throat if I said this in public. <laughs> but uh, but I, I am basing this on my observations of all of these different uh, infrastructures, which they claim are totally uh, decentralized. Mm -hmm. Thank, thank you. By, by, by the way, to give you a, a little of, a, of an insight, so to call it, with regards to this wallet recovery uh when we started looking into the tokenization and started talking to um you know various industrial and, and uh, big institutional companies the losing my access was probably one of the top three questions that they always asked so it is a little really concern and i don't think that there is a way to get around it if we really want to kickstart this technology i mean in the future it may be different but this way it's an easier it just provides an easier and safer trans, uh, entrance igor one more question if i could i think one of the earlier slides um it was talking about acquires and i think i saw the phrase bona fide acquires does the swiss dlt law is that tied specifically to kyc kyb or is there more to quote unquote quote unquote bona fide acquirer uh, no, just essentially they say that uh, in an event when uh, you have you own a certified security and you have your signature somewhere on a piece of paper and there is somebody else, for example, me owning this digitized security that I signed with a private key, well, uh, you have the better, you have the more right because the traditional signature still prevails as well, at least for now. Well, there are no uh, signatures today because securities are dematerialized in most locations. Uh, but, but it seems like the traditional way of uh, custodying has precedence over the ledger way. That's what I read from this. Anyway. Uh, Igor, I have a question on the 
uh, on this particular slide about MTF, OTF. Can we get, get back, look at that for a second? Yes, certainly. Just let me pull it up back again. Do, 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 do. It's not working. Uh, I can see this slide. Yeah, but for some reason, when you, you know, when you uh, share a document oh, over you, you, Zoom, you're they, going, they just glitch incredibly. The one before, just now we saw that. This one, right? Yes. Um, in, in, we all understand about MTF and OTF, um, but what happens if this appear to peer? Because, you know, you and me on, on Bipin can trade independently and list and trades uh, whatever assets amongst ourselves. Are we saying that that's not, that is not an organized facility? That means that somehow this DLT has to be now uh, get approved by the exchange and who owns the the, uh, the ledger itself? Nobody. Well, uh, the DLT trading facility license is uh, issued to a legal entity that uh, wishes to use the beauty of the DLT system and build trading venue on top of it. Uh, so um, it really follows. Uh, it's, similar, it's very similar to what I found in the OTF back in the day, to be honest. It's at least it's an organized trading facility. It, it, the thing is that it's, who owns the DLT? If there's a single ownership, you, we have lots of issues with that. If it is owned by a group of dealers, then, you know, does that mean that it is an organized facility by default? Well, no, because you can't really share the license as far as I can understand it, at least. So you can't say uh, that, okay, I have a bunch of decentralized uh, folks and I want to get the license. So who exactly is getting the license then? You know, name me one. Who will be the legal entity bearing res the responsibility? Uh, so it would be your legal entity, and then it's uh, up to you how you want to organize uh, all of the requirements that we have talked about today. Can we have um, a bunch of people who have licenses allowing a uh, application level access to people like me and uh, money and I and you and who can then trade uh, between ourselves and they allow some kind of a, uh, let us say, um, an algorithmic uh, market making or uh, uh, matching uh, or uh, discovery or, you know, all those things that are not, I mean, that's how most things happen. <laughs> Those things are under the control of certain entities. Um, but what if you have this on the blockchain itself, in which only the legal entities that are allowed to trade are running the nodes and are allowing the access, but then they are allowing uh, this kind of peer-to-peer -peer trading on top of it? I don't know. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm just coming up with some. Mm -hmm. No, it's a really good idea question. Uh, the way I see it, and once again, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, I can be wrong about this, but uh, a DLT is when you just want to uh, operate an exchange build on top of DLT, right? So using, for example, some DLT system. So you get this particular license, and then you're obliged by this particular law to follow a lot of procedures, provide discretionary or not discretionary rules, uh, safe and fair conditions, equal to everybody, yada, 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 etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so then you onboard your clients, but your clients don't need to have uh, any kind of licensing. Uh, I mean, you probably want to verify them. And uh, because once again, I always push for permission system in these applications, uh, not for full decentralizations. So that's the way I see it. And by the way, when it comes to peer-to-peer -peer trading, uh, this is something that can be done, um, well, let's say uh, without the OTF, because uh, when price discovery happens outside of your platform, you don't really need an OTF for that. Yeah, but it all depends on what you mean by OTF. Is it only the guys who are uh, allowing you to trade on their platform because they have verified that you are a, uh, a qualified investor, that all, all that's 
stuff that checking goes on. And then if somebody else is a, another qualified investor, then, uh, you know, then all the trading can happen peer to peer if the facilities uh, provide that, uh, that feature. Again, you know, this is uh, one of those decentralization, centralization questions. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's not a, uh, it's not black and white or a very distinct binary option. Um, uh, maybe if, uh, Ron, can you throw some light on this thing since you're working with other, you know, the lawyers and all, all the DLTs and SEC regulations, how do they view this a DLT as from a regulator's point of view? From the perspective of the lawyers that we work with and just for, you know, Manny, for, thank you for that, for the clarity, uh, you know, around just letting everyone know our legal working group is, um, I spend an unhealthy amount of time with lawyers, Manny, as you know, to so over 150 lawyers um, in our group. And one of the things they focus on really is from a uh, leveraging DLT from a trading facility perspective is, and a lot of them are stateside is very complicated. And they're always defaulting straight to um, existing ATS regulations, for example, or ATF regulations. And what they're finding is that they're struggling to explain some of the capabilities uh, to the regulatory, uh, to the regulators around how this could be used. Uh, I just want to stop there, Manny, because I want to make sure I just, I distracted for a moment. I want to make sure I'm answering the right questions. Um, but, but the lawyers particularly, um, they spend quite a bit of time educating regulators uh, around what, what is meant to be accomplished leveraging the DLT capabilities. You know, so the, 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 you know, the, the question simply is, an RFQ is a peer-to-peer -peer protocol. Yep. Can it happen on a DLT? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question, Manny, and I, I, I don't immediately have the answer to that. I, 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 for our next capital market SIG, I'd love to invite one of our, our capital markets lawyers, if you and Vipin and everyone's comfortable, they could probably answer some of those questions as well. Yeah, that would be great. I mean, yeah. these, yeah, I mean even, even, the, even the definition of who owns the DLT, you know, does it have to be attached to a specific legal entity? Can it right. not be owned by a consortium? Yes, yeah. I think it, it can be. And then uh, we also get into governance conversations, though, right, uh, Manny and Vipin? I mean, because one of the questions I ask is, if who owns the, the, the DLT, who manages and created the governance around access to the DLT? Right. Uh, these, are, these, are, these are pretty in-depth conversations. Yes, but you have those uh, kind of venues in multiple, uh, where multiple parties participate. I know that, you know, for example, exchanges or, or wherever, you know, that those... Uh, I mean, I know that legal entities have, have to be established, but once uh, you are onboarded, like you run one of the nodes or are you, you are one of the dealers on that platform, that immediately puts you, uh, you know, you, you have to have this, uh, you have to be a regulated institution to be allowed to run that. Uh, and the craziest thing about this is that there's so much automated uh, program trading going on between market makers that somehow, uh, you know, some kind of a programmatic matchmaking between peers is not allowed. Uh, it seems like, you know, they have to somehow come up with a understanding of how, can, how it can be allowed in a, in a permission setting. The other question I have is, um, what about, you, you showed all the examples in Europe. Uh, is there anything in the, in the US? Uh, I mean, I know that the OCC has published uh, the stuff about uh, custodying uh, and, and people running the nodes. In fact, that is where I take most of my, uh, most of my thinking from uh, OCC has already uh, uh, published something saying that regulated institutions can run uh, the 
what do they call it, IVNs? Um, so is there any other law in the United States in, in process? Uh, this might be a question for Ron. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to answer that, Vipin, and you're absolutely right. The OCC item is front and center for a lot of colleagues in the financial market space. I think it's important, and again, I realize, Igor, we were talking about the Swiss DLT, but uh, to mapping and comparing uh, with what Vipin's talking about in the States, there are two things that I think are really important, both out of the SEC, uh, sorry, one out of the SEC, one out of FinCEN. Uh, the SEC just posted to the Federal Register, which is when the clock starts ticking on a 60-day comment period, uh, around the, the trading and holding of uh, digital currencies or virtual currencies by what they're calling special purpose broker dealers. Uh, and if anyone hasn't had an opportunity to read that brief uh, proposed rule, it, it's really worth it because it impacts how broker dealers can custody, hold, share, and exchange um, virtual currencies um, and the kind of walls they have to put up around, around trading and, and holding of virtual currencies on behalf of clients. I'm a little concerned about some of that um, because some of it reflects what we were talking about earlier, kind of a lack of understanding on how private keys might be held or managed, not a fully vetted out perspective on custody, uh, et cetera. And I'm happy, I don't have it in front of me, Bippin, but I'm happy to share that with anyone on the call separately. Um, the other is, and I'm not sure um, uh, it's been put on hold for the time being, but as you probably all know, very late last year, as FinCEN put forward um, the ability to manage virtual currencies or trade virtual currencies through hosted or unhosted wallets, which really put a uh, potentially very heavy burden on, on financial market participants in the virtual currency space. Um, and it really missed a whole bunch of stuff around um, unhosted wallets and forcing firms to report um, identifying information of other parties. Uh, and so Manny, to your, your point earlier, um, in, a, in a transaction that is quote unquote off exchange, the, the exchange would have the obligation of reporting above a certain limit who received that crypto. Um, and that's a very heavy burden and really strikes at the heart of decentralization. Uh, so that's a bit of a problem and concern as well. Uh, Ron, are you referring to the travel rule? I'm referring to the original FinCEN NPRM on, um, yeah, well, the $3,000, $10,000 travel rule stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And one is 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 record keeping at three thousand. One is quote unquote immediate reporting at ten thousand. But I think with the incoming with the Biden administration coming in, I know that they put several rules on hold for review. Um, the special purpose broker dealer rule um, is moving forward, um, and I think the last date for commentary publicly is April twenty seventh. And we're planning on commenting. If anyone would like to collaborate on that or or work collectively together, happy to pull you all into that conversation. Vip and many. Obviously, your expertise as well is welcome. Yeah, in fact, uh, I am uh, unfortunately uh, in sympathy with that transcend because it is proportionate regulation, right? Meaning, if you are sending money somewhere, or if you are receiving money from somewhere else uh, today, you are bound by those rules. Meaning. You can't just say, oh, I got it from my uncle in, you know, wherever. Um, I have to say, uh, you know, I have to, it's, it's, in the end, the beneficial owner of the entity that I send it to has to be uh, outside a proscribed list, all of that stuff. So I think they're trying to extend that into the, into the digital currency space, which is not used to that regulation because you don't, you know, obviously exchanges do not look at where the money, where the crypto is coming from or the, where the crypto is going to. They don't have anything to do with that wallet, uh, which is the source or the destination. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's, uh, you know, if you want to keep the same regulation as you have in traditional markets, uh, then you gotta you gotta have that. Otherwise, it will yeah. be very difficult. Yeah, and I I agree with you, Vipin. In principle, I'm you know no one at my organization is advocating fully decentralized. There should be no regulations at all. I agree with you. I think the concern we have is op and and again it applies specifically to institutions. I, I, I'm operationally I'm just concerned about how that how that works. Um, and I I don't know of any neat solutions that make that type of immediate reporting or at least recording of unhosted wallet identifying data easily done. 
Well, I mean, there are, there are ways to, uh, for example, with SSI, it's possible to deposit a proof that you are an authorized uh, uh, receiver, recipient or a, a transmitter mm. without revealing who you are. I mean, there are, there are ways to do this. Uh, the problem is the regulated thoughts do not go into that, uh, into that arena of how you can prove this. I mean, in the end, you have to see, why are you doing this? Because you don't want money to go to guys who are going to, uh, you know, either for money laundering or mm -hmm. other terrorist purposes, whatever. So if you can stop that, so you have to, you have to look at the spirit of the law and can see if uh, new methods, technology can create that uh, circumstance with which you can apply the law in a frictionless manner, meaning not, uh, not impose a huge operational burden on the operators and uh, service this need. Yeah. Anyway, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's another one of those things. Um, SC, so Igor, I think uh, there have been lots of questions. It's uh, wonderful that you came and you presented. And there are many more questions, of course, um, which you would like to ask maybe on email or on the wiki page. And we have come to 11 o'clock. Uh, anybody else has any other burning questions, we can always go over by a couple of minutes. No, but just to clarify, Vip and I have no rich uncles sending me a lot of Bitcoin from own hosted wallet. So I'm not personally concerned about FinCEN, but uh, you make some very good points. Well, I mean, you know, it's, I can say whoever is sending me, but I have to prove that that person sending me this stuff is, right. uh, is not, uh, you know, doing it from the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, having gotten a bribe from some Israeli mining company, you know, which is proven just now. Uh, anyway, so it's, it's all, you know, it's, it's, we have to explore the space to create technological solutions to a certain extent uh, and convince the regulators that they have the same effect as the regulations they have today. Agreed. Um, anyway, uh, I think the next uh, call will be at, I think at 11 a.m. or maybe 10 a.m. I don't know because I think the clocks are switching this weekend. Um, and uh, we are going to have people. So, so I think the new crew is coming on for this. Uh, I'm going to stop the recording. <laughs>